Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to MIC. Did you guys enjoy the opening general session? So now we are all into the changing space of meetings, correct? Um, we have a few housekeeping items that we need to announce. So right now I'm going to have our wonderful uh, room assistant here, Bridget, tell you guys a few things. Good morning. How's everyone? Excellent. So just really quick, we were just going to run through um, a couple of things. Um, I just want you all to um, notice the exit doors and uh, throughout the rest of your sessions as well. Just be aware. Um, just kind of safety and guideline things. There's a lot of people here today, so we're just making sure that everyone realizes where those exit doors are. These ones over here on this side are going to be um, the exit to kind of the back hallways. And then over here, as you know, is the main hallways. So just follow those out um, if, you know, in case of any emergency. And that's basically what I'm here for. So if you have any direction or if anything, anyone needs anything, just go ahead and um, my name is Bridget, and I'll go ahead and guide you through that. Um, with that, we can go ahead and continue our session. So please enjoy. Wonderful. And right now, I do want to bring up Ms. Joan Tezak from the Colorado Society of Association Executives. JT is the executive director, and she has just uh, some other announcements that she would like to make. So thanks, JT. I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here today, and also to all of our panelists and for the team that has put iSummit together for us. I think this is one of the most critical areas uh, for the, the continuing future of our associations and our business. So I look forward to learning with all of you today. So again, thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you, JT. My name is Kelly Cuchera, and I am a sales executive at Image Audiovisuals. And um, today we're going to talk about options in technology. We actually have labeled this session from mild to wild, so we are going to cover the basics and give you a little bit of information on the wilder side of things. But just from a quick poll in the audience, who here is a meeting planner that plans AV? So we have quite a few. I actually misspoke. Which, uh, how many of you like to plan AV? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Different. okay. That changes the dynamic just a bit, doesn't it? Well, that's why we're here today. We're going to talk about technology. Technology. In the simplest definition, technology refers to the practical application of knowledge, especially in a particular area. But I have a feeling to most of you here, technology refers to dollar signs. It refers to headaches. And it also refers to fear, fear of the unknown, right? Well, something like this, for instance. Anybody know what this is? <laughs> right? Anyone? Anyone? It's a rigging plot. Yikes. This actually happens to be the rigging plot from the general session downstairs that you all were just uh, that you all actually attended. And in this rigging plot, you know if you were at the session that there's quite a bit of technology down there. It's a complicated diagram because it does show rigging plots or it shows rigging points. It also shows power and all of these things. But really and truly, I put this up here because it's emblematic of why most of you shudder when you hear the word technology. And more to the point, the letters A and V put together. So today, we are going to tackle some of the basics. Um, and because it, it, is an import, it is a hard question. If somebody asks you what is a must have at an event, there's a lot of different answers that could go for. Um, I, obviously, it's going to depend on the reason you are meeting. It's going to depend on your audience of your session. And I know that you all will find this really tough to believe, but it depends on your budget. It does. <laughs> so today, our goal is to tackle some of the basics and give you all some guidelines to live by as you go forward in planning your next event. 
Joining us today on the, plan, on the panel is Dave Jensen, a resident pioneer of Denver, who began his video philosophy very simply. He said, why can't I turn a live event into a television show? And he really represents the wilder side of our panel today because he does things with live events that many of you have probably only witnessed on television and also movies or sports center, things of that nature. Joining him is also David Mueller, a pioneer in and of himself, who 25 years ago started Image Audio Visuals. And now he personifies a business that has a foothold as one of the most respected audiovisual houses in Denver and nationwide. Not just audio and video and lighting, Image has now embarked to diversify the business to add a division building customized event apps. You actually are using one. Our mobile event app for MIC today is part of Image Audiovisuals. And also we have a division that is setting up digital speaker ready rooms. We also have Dan Song from C3 Wireless. Dan is here to illuminate new paths where often some of you have been stymied by the cost of in-house internet and those types of, of services that sometimes can put a hindrance on your budgets. Joining and finally rounding out our panel is Ms. Amy Drotar. Amy's home base is Polycom, but she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience as a corporate meeting planner over the years. She also is from Polycom, which is a venerable world leader in teleconferencing and video conferencing products. So she is going to bring us the planner perspective on our panel today. So let's get started putting them on the hot seat. I do want to let you all know that this is an interactive discussion, the active part being all of you. So we do have a Twitter hashtag and it is scrolling on the video monitors that you have on the side of the stage. Hashtag iSummit2013. Please tweet your questions, and our social media gatekeeper, Daniela Nillen, who is sitting right here, will read them off to us. Also, I'm old school. Raise your hand. That works, too. <laughs> I can do that. So let's get started. Mr. Mueller. Yes, ma'am. There seems to be an exorbitant amount of choices out there as to what one needs to produce an event. Um, is there any formula that you can use to get started? Mm. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, uh, audiovisual, just by, by definition and by what, what people need and use, it, it changes so much. So it's really kind of a, a custom solution uh, based on needs. Uh, the basics are audio, video, or display, and, and lighting. Um, audio is probably the most commonly used because you can't really communicate with your audience without it. Um, audio also, you know, most venues most hotels have an in-house sound system that uh, for basic, simple meetings, whether they be large or small, might be adequate. There, there's some amazingly good house sound systems in, in a lot of the venues and maybe some not so much. Um, really the delineation is if, if you have anything that's uh, high energy or impactful in your, in your presentation regarding sound, whether it's a a VIP speaker or a CEO or uh, audio or, or audio for a video clip that's played at anything other than a background level, uh, house sound systems probably aren't going to be adequate. So, uh, you know, if it's, if it's kind of a high energy, you know, um, type of environment, then you're probably looking at, at bringing in uh, an external sound system. Now, Mr. Johnston, can you please elaborate on Dave's part and maybe tell us a little bit about audio for larger audiences and why you need something called a delay sound? Oh, absolutely. So for, for larger groups, uh, especially like the group downstairs with a thousand people instead of a few hundred, uh, either delay sound or line arrays, are, uh, they just they reach the back of the room with a consistent level. Um, the, the people at the front aren't blown away and the people at the back aren't asking for more level. So uh, that's, that's kind of the biggest deal for delays and line arrays. Has, it, has anybody, uh, everybody know what a line array uh, sound system is? You've seen the big kind of curved stack of speakers up front. 
Well, each one of concerts. Yeah, you see them a, a ton at concerts. Each one of those speakers is actually in a line. They're all aimed at different points to the audience, and those speakers are capable of, of pushing sound quite a quite a distance. So you can actually cover a very large area with just uh, two stacks of, of line array speakers on each side of the room. Uh, so it's it's technology that's really become uh, a lot more prevalent in the last probably five five to eight years. Uh, but it really, it really helps. It can be less expensive to do line array than it is distribute standard speakers and amplifiers throughout the space. And we actually have some line array uh, downstairs in the general session. So the next time you go down there at lunch, you might want to take a look. Um, but we also have video and lighting as part of our basic AV trifecta of basic needs. So let's talk about lighting a little bit because I know that most of you in here have probably planned events in very well-lit rooms, and it might seem superfluous to have lighting on a stage. So Dave, why is it there a need for lighting if you're already in a very well-lit room? Well, lighting really, stage lighting really uh, becomes uh, a necessity when there's uh, a video camera in the room. If we're doing image magnification that you've seen here, that you've seen downstairs as well, where we're taking a camera feed and we're blowing it up on a big screen. Uh, typically, we do that for large groups so the people in the back of the room can, can uh, see detail of the presenter and facial expressions just like if you were up front. But in order for the cameras to work their best, they need a lot of light. And that's true whether it's a studio environment or a live environment. Um, so that, that's probably the biggest reason to do light. Uh, if there's video display in the room, if we're doing PowerPoint presentations or video roles, um, a lot of times you want to bring the house lights down just a little bit to, to kind of create that contrast. So the screens are the brightest thing in the room because the attention is to the screens is what you want. You don't want a completely well-lit room and have people looking over at the side walls and, and not paying attention. So when you bring the lights down, uh, you also bring the lights down in the room on the stage and then adding a, even a, a small, simple stage wash makes a huge difference because then the audience can see the presenters clearly. Kind of like what we have here. Exactly. <laughs> Is everyone familiar with the term IMAG? Have you all heard of that? It's actually exactly what we're looking at. When they put a live feed of a speaker on a screen, and it's usually used in groups of 500 or so or more, when you kind of have that situation where you have seating that goes all the way to the back of the room, many times we use IMAG to make sure that people who are seated in the back of the room can see clearly and see the speaker's faces. So, wonderful. Now, I know that some of you out there are probably wondering what is the $64,000 question, right? Budget? <laughs> so, is uh, Mr. Jensen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that to you. Um, is there any sort of formula that we can use in, in a budget number? I mean, what, what types of, of helpful hints can you give our planners in the audience? Uh, from my perspective, uh, kind of like Dave already, already mentioned, uh, it's always a custom setup for a custom group. Um, you know, basic AV has a certain budget. When a company like mine comes in, we maybe double that budget or quadruple that budget. Uh, uh, it, it really depends on what your end goal is um, and the size of your group. And you know, the, 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 I guess the one area in AV that, that is you know, kind of budgetable it would be the smaller sets, breakout sessions and things like that because it's, it's kind of the same equipment in every room. So you can, we can get to that fairly easily and fairly quickly, but when we're talking about any type of general session or a main session, um, you know, it, it depends on so many different factors. Uh, Labor is one, uh, you know, the, the number of wireless mics that, that might be there. Uh, it's just, it's so hard to kind of put a finger on it and say it costs this because everybody's needs are slightly different. Although we do see many venues and many hotels that do offer price lists for the smaller bits of items, things like LCD projectors or tripod screens, those types of budgetable items that we do have. I think one of the most misunderstood areas of audiovisual is probably labor. So Mr. Johnson, can you talk a little bit about labor? Labor definitely is misunderstood. 
Uh, we have events on, a, you know, say the ballroom downstairs. If we walk in with 15 or 20 hands to put that ballroom together, uh, some corporate clients say, oh my gosh, 15 people, that's crazy. Where some agencies, like ad agencies, will say, are you sure you can get it done with just 15 people? Uh, so labor is really misunderstood. And, and the time it takes to put things in, uh, you know, that ballroom downstairs didn't come together in two or three hours. It took all day, or maybe even a day and a half. And I think it becomes very attractive when you are signing a contract or, you know, for the planners that we do have, when you're faced with the question of, do I contract for an additional day just to cover setup, or do I rent it the day of and kind of, you know, not have that full day ahead of time? Amy, from a planner perspective, um, do you often contract the day before, or what kinds of things do you find in your world? We definitely have to contract at least a day before, depending on the setup. And you can actually save money even if you're paying rental on that room because your labor costs are going to change. You're not having to bring 20 people in to get it done right away and really fast. You might have 10 people who can do it over a couple of days, and, and it changes things. It helps a lot. Um, and you were talking about the, the house versus bringing people in. For our big events, we always bring groups in that know our setups and, and, and what we expect. But for smaller groups, we can use whatever's in-house. If it's just an LCD and sound for a talking head, you know, then we can definitely do that. And, and I think for, for, from the meeting planner's uh, perspective, uh, one of the things that I think empowers you is to have the choice. Um, you know, we're, we're both an outside AV company and we're in-house in at hotels, so we do both. And there's some phenomenally good AV companies that are in, in hotels and, 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 and maybe some not so much. Um, one of the things that, that I know Amy and I have talked about, and Dave as well, is a lot of hotels, or some hotels, not a lot, are trying to write into your contract that, that specifies that you use the in-house AV provider. Um, and, and we certainly understand why. I mean, the hotels are trying to protect the revenue streams. I get that. But from your standpoint, I think it's really important that you have the freedom to choose. And maybe it, that choice is, hey, the, the in-house company, these guys know what they're doing. They, they you know, I, I really feel a good vibe and I, I want to use them. Um, or it might be, I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable bringing an outside company in. But, but the, the point is, at least you have that choice. Um, Most definitely. And, and having that choice is very, very important for all of you because you should not be just having to use in-house resources or forced to use in-house resources. And we have seen that in contracts, as I'm sure all of you have, when you go to sign your agreements, oftentimes you see clauses in there that are like that. So that's a very, very good point. But also for our suppliers in the audience, I know back to the breakout discussion, sometimes you are not, uh, you cannot sell somebody space because of something called the rooms to space ratio. And basically what uh, Amy was talking about, about I love to plan and have a day ahead of time to set up. Well, in the real world, rooms to space ratio basically means that the space that you can be contracted is officially correlated to the room block that you pick up. So if you have a certain amount of rooms that you are holding, that kind of designates the amount of space that you are able to have. And in this industry, we have things that we lovingly refer to as space hogs. How many of you have heard of space hogs? How many of you have been accused of being space hogs? <laughs> oh, I see. Somebody on our panel is a space hog. Amy, you want to talk a little bit about that? We are definitely space hogs with some of our larger programs. And um, the key to, to getting what you need is to book way ahead and to be flexible, to uh, be flexible with your dates, your patterns those types of things, and to try and find a win-win with the, the venue and the hotels so that both of you are happy with what you have. Um, we, we might throw in extra meals that the staff is going to be there anyway. Instead of going off-site, we'll have an on-site meal, something like that that would um, that, that helps their revenue stream. 
And the other thing is to take the entire value of the event to them. That you're going to say, that, you know, we have a lot of pre and post. We have uh, a ton of people that drink all hours of the night in the bar. All of those are revenue streams that uh, can help make up for us being space hogs. Very interesting. Now, how many of you guys out there um, have had this happen where you may not be in a situation where you're not given enough space or that how many of you have planned by capacity chart? Yeah, I see a few of you out there. Does anybody know what the 20% rule is on capacity charts? Well, those capacity charts are really, really helpful. And they do help you plan for things like classroom, maximizing the most space out of a room, theater seating, all of those types of configurations. The one drawback to a capacity chart is that it does give you numbers that are wall to wall. So it does not take into any sort of specifications for staging, like we have here doesn't give you tables or you know any sort of tech areas, budget uh, buffet tables or anything of that nature. So a good rule of thumb is you take your capacity chart and you subtract that by 20% and that will usually give you a much better interpretation of how many people that you can fit into a room. Very. And, and I think it's really important to, you know, if you have an AV supplier, you know, include them early on in that planning process before you contract space. A lot of times they'll, uh, you know, we can, we can see things that, uh, or notice things that maybe aren't, you know, right off the top uh, with you guys that might impact or be a challenge for how you might want to set the room. Uh, doing a, a, a two-scale drawing showing, hey, this, you guys want 200, 200 people in the audience, two for six, uh, rear projection, two screens, you know, we can build that, that all in and, and actually show you that, yes, this is going to fit, uh, no, or this is going to be, this will fit, but it's really, really tight. But at least you have some options before you contract that space because it's a whole lot harder to un, undo that, un, undo the contract and, and try and get more space after you're in contract. Now, Amy, do you bring your audiovisual providers with you on site tours from the very get-go? For our larger programs, we definitely do. They are part of our site visits, our production company, our RV company, and also our network providers all come and look at what's available at the property to determine what we're gonna need to add in. Um, they look at stuff like rig points and stuff. I don't even notice that stuff when I go into a room. So thank God that they're there to look at it and tell me right off, oh, their closet for the internet doesn't have this and that. and. It, it helps determine the budget very early on and know what we need to negotiate with the hotel beforehand. It's always fun to bring somebody like Dave Jensen on site to talk 208 three phase drops, turtle boxes. Oh, really? Interesting, right? <laughs> Gotta have turtles. Gotta have turtles. Um, but that does bring up a very good point. Involving your audio visual provider from the beginning really can help you because obviously we're gonna be the experts to walk into the room and be able to say, you know what, it's too small. With what you're gonna need and how you're going to need to approach your audience and get your message across at your meeting, this room is not gonna work. So I know that, Dave, you often accompany, as I do in my travels, with your clients as well, do you not? Absolutely. Uh, this room, for example, if I came on this site visit and someone said, I just want to have two sections of this uh, meeting space. All my tables are going to fit with plenty of room for fire exits and all that. I would point out there's a front of house table that takes up a quarter of one room, a camera riser, a stage, a screen. Uh, you know, and we would have doubled the size of this room almost uh, just with AV and, and fairly basic AV. You know, another thing, Kelly, that comes into play sometimes is you'll. You'll see a capacity chart. It'll show that uh, there's 18 foot ceilings in the room. So you're like, well, I, I need to, I need to have, you know, 16 foot wide by 12 foot high screens because I have a big audience. But what you don't take into account is maybe there's a chandelier. Uh, there's eight chandeliers in the space that hang down seven feet. So you really don't have 18 feet of, of ceiling height. You've, you've really got 11 clear. So it, you know, that's one of the things. It's probably the biggest thing that impacts how big of a screen that we can put in. You know, one is how much room we have to throw the, the image from the projector of the screen. 
and the other is how much height we have because that probably more than anything else determines how large of a screen that we can place. Very much so. And that also brings up a great point about diagrams. Um, can we put up the rigging plot once again, just for a brief moment for everyone? Now, this is a great, useful tool, but to those of you that are sitting here, how are you going to really be able to visualize what your set is going to look like? We can start with an empty room, a picture of an empty room, and then we can, with a little bit of magic on the wilder side of things, we can use a program to really conceptualize your set. So we can turn one room from empty into a possibility and then into actual once everything is conceptualized. So these tools are really, really becoming helpful, especially when you have people who are maybe not the best at visualizing things. Here's a picture of the Colorado Convention Center area where we have the app central booth. Hopefully you all got the app. These are just blank pictures. Uh, myself and, and one of my colleagues took these and then we came up with a booth design to conceptualize it. So we got these renderings and you have all seen the App Central booth and you know that it's probably pretty similar to this. So these programs and these audiovisual companies are really starting to get more active in using these types of applications to really design the sets for their, for their customers. And Dave, I know that you have had a lot of experience in this as well. Can you tell us a little bit about what you have done? Sorry. Uh, too many I, days. I think we both do this. Uh, we do. It, it's a great selling point for you, too, uh, for, to go to your client and say, this is really what I want to do. Here's how I'm going to spend your money. To be able to take an, an image like, uh, you know, and uh, two weeks, a month, two months before an event, say, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, it helps your client as much as it helps you. Uh, so it helps us sell. It helps you sell helps everybody get on the same page. And it, and it can be incredibly realistic down to the, the, the exact wall coverings and the carpet. You know, we can replicate that in the, in the 3D fly through that, that we present to you that you would present to the client. So it can be in, incredibly photorealistic. And this is becoming a very, very big part of production business is really trying to get into the conceptualization of the sets because for you all, we heard you. We know that a diagram with a few tables and chairs really isn't enough anymore. So we are expanding our horizons out to really, really use these types of renderings to give you guys, you guys a better idea and also better options out there. Now one area that I know has kind of been a hot button for all of you and a lot of the research I've been doing is wireless. And Mr. Dan Song has been very, very on our panel today. <laughs> I'm uh, so, Dan Song, why on Kelly. earth is internet so pricey? Well, I'm going to quote my mentor, first of all. Uh, he took a survey amongst a uh, broad demographic of hotel guests, and he concluded that people would uh, rather have wireless um, and give up a cup of coffee or a hot shower. Now, personally, <laughs> I'm not sure about the hot shower. but. Um, before, back when wireless was popping up around hotels and venues, it was a nice perk to have just to check your email and internet, your stock quotes, sports scores. But now it's a key component, and I would even say a necessity for uh, meetings and events um, for them to conduct business. Uh, especially with the explosion of smartphones, uh, iPads and tablets, and cloud computing, um, it's also critical for conducting business that people need to attend to um, while at these meetings, th often through their corporate VPN. So there's a lot of bandwidth needs, and most hotels uh, and venues recognize this, and so they see this as a revenue stream, but also a way to recoup their investment in their IT infrastructure and pass along costs um, from their communication provider to the end user. Definitely. So, for instance, a good analogy would be if a hotel is renovated, and you now have a nice 55-inch LED TV and a numerous amount of channels that you can select from that are very, very much like what you have in your own home, um, your room rate goes up. So that fluctuates with that type of, of um, renovation. So we see the same thing in internet and in wireless. Now, how many of you guys out there have internet at your meeting or have 
a desire for internet at your meeting? Pretty much the whole room. How many of you think that internet is super cheap? <laughs> right? It just, it's just, it's really, really an unfortunate hindrance on a lot of people's budgets. So Dan, are there any other ways that maybe you can curb the cost or maybe some other resources you can talk about? Uh, yeah, Kelly, there are, there are ways to curb internet costs. Uh, most hotels um, and venues that my company works with, they do charge a standard rate um, for a network drop or they charge a standard rate for wireless per device. Um, but there's a lot of variables and what hotels charge, um, it's across the board from my experience. Um, so if you're on a shoestring, bu shoestring budget, um, well, you can bring in a company like us and we look at what your network needs are based on uh, what you want to use the network for, let's see how many users and meeting rooms you, uh, you want covered, and we'll see if we can uh, save you money or if the hotel is a better way to go. So now for small groups of users, up to five users, the cheapest option is a solution like MiFi from Verizon. It's basically like a little wireless router that you can plug in and up to five users can connect um, to your internet. Um, you can also use your personal uh, smartphone or an iPad and uh, use a technology called tethering and use that as a hotspot. And again, that's up to good for up to about five users. So that's really for like a production room or um, a, just a small meeting room space. So that's not really practical probably for you guys. So um, on the higher end of uh, number of users, let's say 25 users, you can use uh, something called a cradle point router. Um, that's very similar to a wi uh, the MiFi, except it can handle more users and it's got more uh, uh, options to configure things, um, um, personalize it. So, um, and finally, we um, our company offers a solution called Cloud CloudLink Mobile, and that can support up to 50 users per meeting room. And um, you know that's still not too expensive a solution. And again, it all depends on what the hotel charges and we can compare what the costs are. Sometimes we can save you guys money, sometimes we can't. Um, um, and most of these solutions, in fact, all of these solutions that I just talked about now operate through the cellular network of uh, Verizon or AT&T. Um, and they use a SIM card or what people often refer to as an air card. And depending on where you're located, geography, signals, and the signal strength, uh, your data speeds can vary from one megabit per second to about 12 megabits per second. So on the higher end, 12 megabits per second, you can actually use that for internet and some, some video. Um, for one megabit per second, you really can't do much except for just check your email and browse the web. Now, does price fluctuate with bandwidth? It does. Um, most of these carriers, they charge you a flat fee of $50 a month or so for about five gigabytes of bandwidth. Um, now, if you go over, over that amount, uh, it can cost you significantly more, so you have to be careful. Five gig gigabits is a, the equivalent of downloading three movies from iTunes, so it can, it can get chewed up pretty quickly. So what about for, for instance, uh, if we have trade shows or somebody who holds a trade show in here that you want to provide internet for on a trade show floor of, say, 150 exhibitors, what is the megabyte bandwidth that I would need in order to make that happen? Again, Kelly, it depends on what you're using the network for, but um, typically f five megabits per second would be sufficient um, for 150 users as long as they're not all concurrently using it and not downloading a lot of uh, big apps or uh, files at the same time. And I think we've all uh, seen how Wi-Fi is, is interrupted sometimes if, if there are a lot of users in the room on at the same time. Sometimes it's not as strong, the signal strength varies. Um, and we do see that, definitely so. Um, so let's say, since you did bring up the wilder side of, of your company, Dan, let's say I have a thousand people in an audience and I want to demo a new product, and my new product is a website. So all thousand people in the audience will need to be on the internet at the same time, and I will need to have a continuous connection. Um, what's the price point of, say, bringing in somebody like that, uh, like yourself? Uh, well, for a thousand people, um, and we've done a thousand users, actually we've done up to 4,000 users, the cost can vary widely, again, based on what their network needs are and what they're using it for. Um, the cost ranged anywhere from $10,000 to about $100,000. Um, 
But for what you're describing and your situation, it would probably be on the lower end for basic wireless connectivity, about 10,000. Um, we bring in all of our uh, equipment, routers, switches, wireless access points. And of course, we have to justify if, if it's gonna save our clients money um, or if they can go a cheaper route and use the hotel's wireless. So, but we do add value bringing our, bring in our own equipment because we can monitor and uh, control the network, um, whereas the hotel, sometimes they're, they're off-site, they're not even um, at the property itself, um, so we, we do provide value in that, and there's some justification for, for our costs. And I do know that some of the smart devices that are available today, the tablets, iPads, iPhones, things of those natures, they actually do have uh, a built-in hotspot or something that can turn it into a wireless device and sometimes you could connect that to five other users in the room so there are some definite options out there for wireless and now that we see hybrid meetings really becoming active and webinars as a way to reach people and educate the masses the need for internet is beginning to be a lot more prevalent